Well, well, welcome everyone this evening. It's uh, great to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I got a scripture reading <clears throat> uh, taken from the sixth chapter of Hebrews. <clears throat> Therefore, not leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of dead works, of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead and, the, and of eternal judgment. And we will go on into perfection if God permits. We will stand and sing hymn number 401. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day you've given us. I pray that your spirit will be welcome in here and that you will be with Brother Don to give his message. Uh, will it be able to open our hearts to it? In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. If I can get my uh, computer to come on here. Well, what do you know? There we go. Our scripture reading this evening comes from Genesis, first chapter, first verse. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I reveal unto you concerning 
this heaven and this earth. Write the words which I speak. I am the beginning and the end, the Almighty God. By mine only begotten created I these things. Yea, in the beginning I created the heaven and the earth, and upon, upon which thou standest. And the earth was without form and void, and I caused darkness to come upon the face of the deep. And my spirit moved upon the face of the waters, for I, God, for I am God. And I, God, said, Let there be light, and there was light. And I, God, saw the light, that the light was good. And I, God, divided the light from the darkness. And I, God, called the light day, and the darkness I called night. And this I did by the word of my power. And it was done as I spake. And the evening and the morning were the first day. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. thank you for that beautiful ministry of music and uh, from the uh, Goodrich family, Matt and Esther, and thank you artists for your play. We are here in front of the cameras tonight with very few in the audience because of the snow that we've got here in Independence and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Very happy that you are uh, able to watch and are uh, uh, 
watching us on live stream and Facebook and uh, welcome you very much. I was uh, speaking to uh, my class that I have on uh, a telephone on Sunday mornings, people in the outlying areas, and a uh, lady from uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, told me that the uh, snow in her yard uh, sits at seven feet. <laughs> seven feet. So she said the snowblower can't throw it any higher than that. So we certainly have had quite a uh, winter this year. And I will put in a plug. If you're watching, um, you can go on the church website. You can make a one-time donation or set up uh, repeated donations. Or you can drop a check or a money order in the mail. The uh, address is 700 West Lexington, Independence, Missouri, 64050. The uh, expenses of the church continue uh, even though we do have snow. I want to talk to you this evening about the power of God. The power that he has and demonstrates is one we truly don't fully understand. It is an amazing thought to think that simply the word was spoken, let there be light. And in that instant, creation took place. Everything that is on this planet lives because of light, directly or indirectly. The animals that are upon it eat the grass, which is, gets its life from photosynthesis and um, uh, the energy that comes from those plants gives them to the animals, and then there are, of course, some animals that eat other animals. Uh, even in the oceans, we have um, photoplankton that is generated, microscopic uh, um, creatures that are generated from light into the water, and uh, that is the basis for the life in the sea. Everything on this planet comes from light. It's life for our world, for the creation in which we are, for ourselves. And without that light, without that creation, without that power being given to this planet, there wouldn't be any life. And so the life, the light that exists, that light that we see, we look into our eyes and we use it, that light is the power of God. There's also that light which we call understanding or intelligence also that comes from the power of God. And looking at how God uses his power, we see that he uses it for the benefit of mankind. Without that light in our planet, God would still be God, but we wouldn't be here. And so that power that he gives, he gives as it benefits his creation, mankind. We constantly ask each other or suggest to each other that we don't judge. You know, don't judge me because I'm doing this or I'm doing that. And we often say, well, you can't tell me this is wrong or that's wrong. And that's true. I can't tell you what's right or wrong, but God does. And by his word, he gives what is right. He gives what is wrong. And he gives us the instructions, the commandments, the direction, the insight, whatever you want to call it. He gives that to us so that we understand how to live. You have a child comes into the kitchen. And they're curious as to what's on the stove. And you say, don't touch that. It's hot. Not because you don't want the child to investigate or understand or learn what his environment is. You want the child to not be harmed. And so the commandments that we have are for that very benefit. 
The, what we call the laws of God are for the benefit and the protection of us, his children, his creation, that we might be benefited from those things that he teaches us. We read in John, the 10th chapter and the 9th verse. And I was supposed to prepare a list of my scriptures, and I did not do that, so I will pause, give you time to turn to them. John, the 10th chapter, the 9th verse. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. The instruction that he gives us, even when it is as harsh as thou shalt and thou shalt not, it is simply that we might have an abundant life. The stories that he gives us, the parables that we have, the teaching that we receive, the insights that he gave to the prophets and to those that are, have written in the scripture are simply that we might learn what that abundant life can be if we put those principles into our lives. God has given us his word that we might follow it to our benefit. I have a few examples. Seventh chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 7, starting with the 15th verse. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and the mountains fled, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course, and the roar of the lions were heard out of the wilderness. And all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. Was it that Enoch did anything, that power through the language God had given him, that instruction and that ability for him to speak the word of God, and these things come to pass, and all nations feared and stayed away. And the people of Enoch City were protected. Note that if he had the power to move mountains, he probably had the power to just simply wipe away the armies. But that wasn't how he did it. Army is coming up, well, let's just move a mountain over here and keep them from coming. They turn around and go back home. The benefit of those that were in obedience as well as protecting those who had the opportunity to repent and change their lives. Can you imagine that kind of power? That greatness. And even with that power, it was not used for the benefit of individuals. Or it would have been lost. We find in the 81st section of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 81, and I'll start with verse 3a. And again, I say unto you, I give unto you a new commandment that you may understand my will concerning you. Or in other words, I give unto you directions how you may act before me that it may turn to you for your salvation. Now that's a great understanding. I give unto you a commandment, but it's not simply because I want to tell you to do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that. It is so you can learn how to live before me that it might turn to your salvation, that it's for your benefit. This commandment, this understanding, this instruction and direction which I give you is for your benefit. 
And that instruction was, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. But when you do not what I say, you have no promise. No, God is still God no matter what we do. We're obedient, he's God. We're disobedient, he's still God. When we're obedient, it benefits us. We have a promise, a covenant. When we don't, that promise is gone. We have no promise. There's nothing we can do. Now, there's a story in 1 Kings. It's in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, and I'm going to start with the 19th verse. It's a story about Elijah. And uh, I heard this from someone else. This isn't my thinking, but uh, Cecil B. DeMille sure missed his opportunity. This story of Elijah calling down uh, uh, fire from heaven, I can just see this on the big screen. <laughs> We're going to go through this here and uh, uh, take a few moments to talk about it. And I want us to understand how this would play out. Imagine yourself being here and watching this come to pass. 1 Kings 18th chapter 19th verse. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 uh, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now that's 850. And you know <laughs> the royalty was going to come and they didn't come by themselves. They brought their entourage. So there's quite a few folks showing up. And this is just the other side. We're going to read here in a minute that he tells all Israel to come watch. There's a great multitude of people that are coming to see this. And you can imagine people that have been given some kind of authority coming in their display and splendor and uh, parading themselves in the appropriate order, you know, the one that's the head Kuba, he's in the there, then who's second and third, and all the way down to the 450th one. And he wasn't going to be outdone, so he had to have on some pretty robes and everything, too. And so get this in your mind, this huge uh, array of people in all of their pomp and circumstance who were the prophets of Baal coming to Mount Carmel. And verse uh, 20, so Ahab, now remember who we're talking to here. Ahab was the king of Israel. He married Jezebel. They, she t uh, uh, brought the priests of Israel unto worship of Baal. They were worshiping idols and they were the, the uh, prophets and the priests of Baal but they were Israelites. They knew better, they just weren't doing better. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. Can you imagine? Here's the king of all of Israel, all of his entourage and all of the priests, and Jezebel is queen, and they're all up there, and they've paraded themselves here to this spectacle that the prophet of God is called, and he asks a question. How long are you guys going to take to make up your mind? Either God truly is God or that idol is God. And with the king standing there, they were silent. That had to slap in the face of Ahab and Jezebel. 
Their silence spoke volumes. But they were too afraid of the king to say God is God. That spoke volumes as well. So here we have the situation. Verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it into pieces, and lay it on wood, and put, on, and put uh, no fire under it, I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And call ye of the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well. Ahab threw down the gauntlet, said, Let's have a test. And they said, Okay, goody. You prove who's God. We'll follow. And so here it was. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose you one of the bullocks for yourself and dress it first. For ye are many. Call on the name of your gods and put no, fi put no uh, uh, fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and they called on the name of Baal in the morning even till noon saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered and they leaped upon the altar which was made. Now here again, I can see Hollywood just putting this on. You can imagine 450 guys all trying to outdo the other one. I'm going to be the one that Baal listens to and answers. And so they had to be dancing around and jumping and hollering and doing all sorts of things. And here's all of Israel watching, waiting. And they didn't just spend a couple of minutes. They started in the morning and they went past noon. Nobody stopped for a buffet. Nobody was taking a nap. Well, there might have been some kids fall asleep. But here they were putting on this spectacle, and there was no answer. In verse 27, I just love this. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud. You know, get louder. Baal can't hear you. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he's on a journey. Or preadventure, he sleepeth and must be awakened. So he's poking the bear. They've picked their bullock, they've put him on the altar, and they're doing all their uh, dancing around and everything that's going on. And he's saying, holler louder. He can't hear you. Now, we're going to learn in a minute, or we're going to read here in a minute, that Elijah was sandbagging. This wasn't his idea. God told him to do this. He knew what the outcome was going to be. And so I can just see the king <laughs> when his priests didn't perform what they were supposed to perform and here's this irate prophet hollering at him, holler louder. I can see the mood of them that were there. And they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till their blood gushed out of them. And it came to pass that midday was past, and they pro uh, uh, prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. They spent all day. We're getting on towards the evening. 
And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near. And he uh, repaired, the, repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Can't you just see Elijah getting up now after they've spent all day and he's saying, Watch this. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying Israel shall be thy name and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed I looked up how much a measure of seed was they didn't measure their land by acres like we do, or miles, or kilometers. They measured their land by how much seed it would take to put in a crop. Now, some acres of land were not as good, so they didn't take as much seed. Other, others were better for farming and took more seed. So it was a it was a description of how well their land was, how much land they had, but that's what a measure of seed was. It was how much it took to put in a crop to a given area. And as best I can understand, there I got from three different uh, uh, Bible commentaries, that was approximately six gallons. Now, that's a considerable trench around an altar, something that will hold six gallons. So he put the wood uh, in order, cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. <laughs> now he's already goaded them all day long. Now he's really sandbagging. They've got their altar and they've done their thing. They've spent all day long. I've built mine altar. We're going to have a burnt offering. Put four barrels of water over it. Fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Now, I don't know how big their barrels were. I couldn't find that out on, on the uh, uh, searches that I looked at. Uh, when, you, when I have seen shows where they've uncovered uh, ancient vessels, barrels were not very large. They weren't the 55-gallon drums that we're accustomed to. You know, that's what a barrel of oil is. That wasn't the size. The barrels were, were the size you could pick up and carry. But, uh, or at least that's what I see when they uncover ancient ships. But nonetheless, they did it three times. They drenched the altar, they drenched the wood, they drenched the uh, uh, sacrifice and filled the trench, probably to overflowing. It says, and the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. Now, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. You see, God told him to do this. He didn't dream it up. He's being obedient. God is going to demonstrate by his power who is really God because the Israelites had forgotten. Their politicians had led them off in the wrong path. We're not going into politics tonight. But their leaders had led them to false doctrine. The Lord was going to set forth an example. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that all this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou mayest turn their heart back again. 
took no glory unto himself, simply asked the Lord to do what the Lord said he was going to do. And then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood. It didn't just burn it. It consumed it. Consumed the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Fire from heaven consumed it completely. What do you think the people of Israel did? Just stood there with their mouth open? <laughs> and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I imagine some of them might have stuttered. I would have. I can just see the fear, the awe, the majesty of the power of God consuming everything. As I said, Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood missed an opportunity. I would love to see that put on a play I don't know how we'd get that on a play artist with uh, uh, consuming it all. We'd have to have a trap door and get it to drop by and down, I guess. But uh, can you imagine? Now, this is a demonstration. It's not the only. I just picked it because I, I think it's a neat demonstration. I, I would love to have been there to see this. I would love to see the faces of all of those that had danced around all day, cut themselves and done everything else and all of the stuff that they had did. And Elijah just said a prayer. Poof. It's all consumed. Now, who's God? When we think of the power of God and we think of how he demonstrates his power, it is for our benefit. He did this that the children of Israel might understand He is God and bring themselves back into obedience of His commandments. It was for their benefit. They fell on their face recognizing that God is God. I did like the line come out of uh, Moses uh, that Cecil B. DeMille's did and uh, Pharaoh's army is lost in the sea and he goes back to Egypt and, and the queen says, you know, where's the blood of Moses on your sword? And he says, his God is God. There's a line. Could you imagine if you were the Pharaoh and you saw fire, pillar of fire keeping your army from going down into the valley and then when it disappears you run out into the ocean and your army's gone? Uh, yeah. His God is God. The same thing Ahab had to realize and what's so sad. The people changed. Ahab and Jezebel didn't. We won't go into what happened to them, but you might want to read that. Forgiving sin. God has the power to forgive sin. Sent his son to teach us the, the lessons that we should learn and teach us about how uh, God forgives sin. Let's go to Matthew, the ninth chapter, and I'll start with the second verse. Matthew 9, 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of palsy, laying on a bed. And Jesus, knowing their faith, said unto the sick of palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Go thy way and sin no more. And behold, the certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Now, note they said that. 
to themselves. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore is it that thou thinkest evil in your hearts? For is it not easier to say, this, thy, uh, thy sins be forgiven thee, than to say, Arise and walk? But I said this, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Has power from God the Father to forgive sin. Jesus said unto the sick of palsy arise, palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy home. And he immediately arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power unto men. I would imagine my chin would have dropped as well. I've had the misfortune of being in hospitals, and rest homes and nursing homes and seeing people that suffer. Wouldn't it be miraculous? Wouldn't it be marvelous for someone with that power to go through and empty the hospitals? God gives his power to forgive sin. And we must remember that this life is but a probation. And what we do with what we're given is what is important. Casting out devils. Twelfth chapter of Matthew. Starting with the 18th verse. And there was brought unto him one possessed with the devil blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the, the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard that he had cast out the devil, they said, This man doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Now, here we go. Uh, you want to call it politicians, uh, uh, professors of universities, the leaders of the day, you know, you're stepping on my turf. They come to me to seek for forgiveness and to give alms that I'll pray for them. And you heal them? And so they cast a disparaging word as to how he gets his power. Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to dis uh, desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast out devils? Therefore, they shall be your judges. When your people pray and God blesses the people they pray for, are they doing that by devils? Can you imagine that would silence them for a moment? Well, it silence me forever, but you're going to put a finger at me when a blessing from God is given and say it comes from the devil? Then how do your blessings come from? But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. For they also cast out devils by the Spirit of God. For unto them is given the power over devils that they may cast them out. You see, he admitted the power to receive blessings from God had been given to mankind. The kingdom, the keys of the kingdom were there. As long as they obeyed them, as long as they followed after the direction of God, he was there.
to bless them and everything that he does for us every manifestation of his power is to benefit mankind God has given a portion of his power to mankind on earth to build and establish his kingdom. How could we bring to pass the kingdom of God or be any part of bringing to pass the kingdom of God if we had not his power? Section 65, and I'll start at the beginning. 65 1a. Hearken and lo, a voice is one sent down from on high who is mighty and powerful, whose going forth is unto the ends of the earth, yea, whose voice is unto men. Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. The keys of the kingdom are committed unto men on the earth, and from thence the keys or the authority, from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth as the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hand shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. Yea, a voice crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, prepare ye the supper of the Lamb, make ready for the bridegroom. Pray unto the Lord, call upon his holy name, make known his wonderful works among the people. Call upon the Lord that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it. Think on that a minute. If we just sit back and do nothing and expect God to wave his hand and to bring it into being, it's never going to happen. Keys are committed to the men on earth. The power and authority of God is given to us to prepare ourselves, to make ourselves ready, to bring to pass that kingdom by the choices we make, the things that we do. And by doing so, then the inhabitants of the earth may receive the blessings of that kingdom and be prepared for the days to come in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven clothed in the brightness of his glory to meet the kingdom of God which is set up on the earth. Wherefore may the kingdom of God go forth. The kingdom of heaven may come that thou, O God, may be glorified in heaven so on earth that thy enemies be subdued for thine is the honor, power, and glory forever and ever. The authority, the power, the ability, the instruction, the direction, the commandments are given unto men for men to use to bring themselves unto obedience of the commandments of God, to follow after the laws of God. That's an interesting point. The laws of God. Some will say that God gave thou shalt, thou shalt not laws, mosaic law, set in stone, this is how it is. Along came Jesus Christ and said, The law is fulfilled in me, so the law is done away with. If the law is done away with, is it okay to worship false idols? No. It says, Thou shalt not kill. Well, is that done away with? No. The laws that he has given have not been done away. God never changes. The fulfilling of those laws and the spirit of the law which Christ brought to us is the fulfillment of that law. Now consider, God speaks to man in his own language. 
I doubt very seriously he spoke to Enoch in English. I doubt very seriously he spoke to Adam in English. I'm pretty sure he didn't speak to Elijah in English. He speaks to man in man's own language. Do you think there is a loss in translation when you consider the language of God and you dumb it down to the language of man? He had to give the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. That's all they could understand. The Spirit takes us beyond that. It doesn't eliminate the law. It fulfills the law. Why do I not steal? There's a whole multitude of reasons. Not least of all, the guilt that is on me. Not to consider the loss of who I stole from. There's a multitude of reasons why we don't steal. And the spirit of the law explains or instructs mankind to go beyond his limited language and understand the fullness of what God would have us to understand. Give us instruction that we might know how to act before Him. That when we heed His word, we have a promise. So the law of God is always the law of God. And we grow in our understanding or should grow in our understanding. If we allow that Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and our minds, that we might discern the truths, that as we read the words of the Scriptures, they become alive in our understanding. For how many times have you, I know it has been many times for me, have you read something in the Scripture and the 10th, the 15th, the 50th time you read it, a light bulb comes on. Oh, that's what that means. Or you see it from some other or someone else's perspective and suddenly you have a new understanding. It's the same word. It's the same doctrine. It's the same scripture. But suddenly now you have a greater understanding. That's the spirit of the law. Doesn't change the law. It fulfills the law and gets us to a greater understanding of what the law of God truly is. You see, Zion is waiting for you and I to become the doers and not the hearers of the word. Moses talked with the Lord face to face at the door of the tabernacle. Did the Israelites establish Zion? No. The brother of Jared not only saw the finger, but saw the whole body and spoke to the people. And with such a great leader, they still did not bring to pass Zion. Elijah, <laughs> in the story we just read, I'm sure in that moment they, they were ready to do whatever. But what about the next day and the day after and the year after? They didn't establish Zion. It is not the power or the level of our leader that will establish the kingdom of God on earth. It is the obedience of of the saints. It is when you and I put the Spirit of God into our hearts that we live the Word of God. That's what we're waiting on, preparing ourselves to be obedient, to bring that power of God into our very lives 
that we might truly be his children. And if you want to see the kingdom of God come to pass, then it's up to you. It's up to me. We will do so. The kingdom of God is no nearer nor further away than our spiritual conditions justify. We've read several examples of the power of God. Scriptures are full. Old Testament, New Testament, Asian continent, the American continent, filled with the power of God today. We could gather a group of people here and talk about the miracles that we've seen. And I've seen them. Man walk into the uh, office at the church on crutches, barely move, sat down, was administered to, stood up, picked up his crutches and put them over his shoulder and walked out. The power of God is given to the lives of men and women if they will become obedient. The power of God is within your hands. That's what is meant. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's waiting for you to prepare your life as to how you may live, that you keep the word of God, that you are obedient, and you keep that covenant that is that promise that makes you that child of God. So let us take this opportunity. Just as those that saw the fire of heaven fall down, just as those that saw the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, just as we have witnessed the miracles that God gives and the blessings to his people, let us renew our covenant and let us go on from here into perfection which is possible difficult but possible let us take the power of God and put it into our hearts let us be the children of God that follow after his precepts and his commandments and I pray God will bless you in all of your righteous endeavors and that you will become his valiant soldiers to labor in bringing to pass the kingdom of God. May it be so. Amen. Thank you, Brother Don. We will stand and sing hymn number uh, 
Lord our God, we, are, we bow our heads before you now in humble recognition of your power, of your love, and we thank you for the blessing that we have had this night, for the word that you have shared to, to us through our brother, for the spirit that has attended to each one of us. I would pray for a blessing upon all those who are listening, that they might abide in you and you in them, that your power might be in them, the power to resist the calling of this world, the power to go forth and to show the world your holy works, to demonstrate your power, to fear not, but to live your word, to shine forth your light, your wisdom, and your power to all those who would listen. We pray these things in the holy name of Christ Jesus. Amen.